PC or laptop, if you like.
Now I hope that you can read at least the beginning because that is what a security context looks like. A security context uh, consists of the user, the role, and the type. That is uh, the system in which SE Linux uh, X, uh, allocates rights to certain things. It works like this. It's really simple once you've understood it. Users are authorized for one or more roles. The role is exactly that. It's a role, it's what I am doing. When I log in into the system, I am usually a user. First of all, I'm a user, so I, I am in the user role. If I want to do system administration tasks, I switch into the sys administration role. If the system is um, set up for multiple administrators, there might be a web administrator role. There can be several users which are authorized for that role. So you can have several admins, and you can separate them. So there's users who can access roles. Roles have access to certain types, pretty much the same system. Uh, a role can do certain things. Um, the role for a uh, web server administrator, for example, would have to restart the web server, edit its configuration files, stuff like that. So the, the roles, uh, the, the rights actually flow down through the system. The user in front is persistent. I am always the user Tom, even if I change to root via the uh, regular Unix SU command, for example. This enables the system to keep track of who is actually doing what. One of the main problems with most servers with more than one admin is that something bad happens and nobody did it. <laughs> yeah, we all know that. Roles, on the other hand, can be switched. The idea is of uh, the idea behind SE Linux is minimum privileges, as in all security systems, of course. So I can always change into that role which I need for my current task. If the policy allows me to do that, of course. Not every user is authorized to enter the sysadmin role. Types and um, domains is just another name for types applied to running processes. So types <coughs> can transition into new domains if a program is executed. <coughs> There's an example on the next slide which will clear all this up. I just want to run it down all in, in one go first. And finally, file types, which are also labeled with a security context, are set by, by policy rules. The policy defines which file is in which type and which process runs in which domain. Okay, let's give you a little bit of example because all this has been very, very theoretical. And this is what actually happens. This is a simple example, but it shows what the SE Linux system usually does. On the system is a user, Tom, who is authorized for the role of sysadministrator. The sysadministrator role can execute files that are labeled with this special type, HTTP, the exact type. Uh, the naming is, is just a convention. We usually name all types with an underscore T at the end, and all roles with an underscore R at the end. That's just a convention, it could be any name. So the sysadmin role can execute the HTTP exit type, which is the type that the Apache binary is labeled as. So when the system administrator executes Apache, there is a rule in the policy that says a transition happens from this file type to the domain HTTP type. And now we have Apache running in a dedicated domain that is only used by Apache and by nothing else. Let me show you a simple example of what that means. Okay, in case you can't read that, which 
I'm fairly sure most of you can't. This is just a regular ID command, and it, it, ID is one of the tools which has been patched in such a way as it also shows the context that I'm currently running in. And I'm currently running in a context Tom, user role, user type. Which means that uh, this X term is just a normal user operation. So when I issue this command, PSAXF, I usually see every process running on the system. In fact, on the SU Linux system, I don't. Because the user type doesn't have the right to see the system processes, much less to kill them. So this is an example of which, uh, that which I tried to show with the Apache um, type, that the dedicated commands actually separate the various processes from each other in such a way that I can't even see them anymore. There is no Getty in this list. There is no SSH, there are no current processes. Everything that I see are the processes owned by me. Every user can by default only see what he himself is running. So that is an example for the, the separation that I can achieve with uh, a few simple policy tools. Okay, that was a really very, very short overview on, on how the system works. What it actually achieves is a higher level of security for me. For an otherwise regular Linux system, and this is why. <clears throat> and this also details a little more about how the system functions. The kernel patch contains several additions to the Linux kernel. One is called the security server. <clears throat> the security server is not a process, it's just a part of the kernel. And the kernel has also been patched to consult the security server at every system call. So I can write a policy, very, very fine grained because every system call is checked against the security server and I can control in the policy the access rights for every user, for every domain and essentially for every program as to what system calls it may do or may not do. That means that I can, for example, on file writes, I don't have read, write and execute. I actually can control if I have open, append, stuff like that. The second part I already mentioned is the Mac. The policy cannot be evaded. The, the security server is consulted at every syscall. There is some caching for performance reasons, but there is no syscall that is not checked against the policy. So I, I simply don't have race conditions. If I do not have the right, then I, I don't have it, never. And the most important the most interesting uh, thing probably is the other part, <coughs> through the separation of roles, I've broken the total power of the root account. Root, <coughs> root is not more mighty than any other account on the system, depending on which role it wants. I can also show that. permissions are orthogonal to the non-Unix permissions. They are independent 
And in order to get permission to do something, I need to satisfy both. I need to have the regular Unix permissions to, for example, access the files, and also the policy must allow it. If either of these fails, the kernel delivers back a permission denied to the process, and nothing happens. <clears throat> As a normal user role, I cannot even change into the root directory to read its files or modify its files. Actually, we thought about uh, <coughs> showing uh, what, what's probably the most powerful demonstration of the root separation just running RMSRF, which you can do on the asset running system, except that I don't have any installs with me. I just don't want to risk it right now. Mostly, <clears throat> mostly because uh, uh, this system was hacked together with a little, uh, a little on short, uh, short one. But uh, Russell Cocker, for example, one of the main um, project members from SU Linux, has a play machine on the internet. Uh, the root account is um, open for SSH logins and uh, the root password is posted somewhere, it's pretty simple, I don't know, root or test123, something like that. And you can actually log in as root on the system and you can do that. Totally gone bonkers program for you. Like 
delete its own configuration files and maybe stuff like that. But it cannot corrupt your entire system. Uh, Russell has um, a very favorite hobby of his, logging into IRC as root. Everyone constantly tells them that's a really, really bad idea. And he usually shouts back, come on and hack me. There's a special policy for IRC clients, because an IRC client really doesn't need to do very much. It needs to access the screen, it needs to, um, to connect outwards to the outer world, and maybe it needs to write files in this specific download directory. And that's very much it. And if you have these permissions and nothing else, there isn't, there isn't much that you can do to corrupt the system. Now we're slowly venturing into the area where it gets practical. I think all this theory is fairly boring to most of you, to me as well. And um, the main reason why both of us are here is that we actually want to help people who are interested in this stuff to take a look and maybe install it on their own systems. So how does installation work? You have two sources for the programs and the kernel patching. You can either download and compile the sources from the MSA website or from Sourceforge. But there are also packages available for Debian, Gentoo, SUSE, Red Hat, so for most of the common uh, distributions, there are ready-made packages that you can install with the regular package manager and have an nice line of system running in no time. The important part of the system is the policy. The policy is a single document which lists what you can do and what you can't do. The policy is the point where all your security can break. If you allow your web server access to that KNAM, then it's game over. So if you make a stupid mistake in the policy, then you can compromise the entire security of your system. So the policy is the important part. The policy is pretty frightening at first because it's extremely long. It does have the advantage, of, however, of uh, getting all your small problems into one place. Instead of having to audit like a hundred different services, you have one policy. And it doesn't change if you upgrade to a different version. Usually if you have a really secure system, like <clears throat> if you're in the military or someone from the CIA here, I don't know, then you have the problem that you have a an audited system when you know that the system is secure, and you can't, you can't update it because you would have to run the whole audit cycle again. The policy doesn't change if you update uh, to a new version of your program because the program is still doing the same things. So there's no, re no need to change the rights that it gets. One thing that I, I wanted to have on the slides because it is probably one of the most often made mistakes um, that we see on the mailing list is uh, that people forget to read a file system. I said that earlier that every object in the file system is labeled with a security context. If you don't have those labels, then they all default to unlabeled type. An unlabeled type has no rights whatsoever. Uh, that is usually the place where your system just stops a hold. Because the kernel can't access any hardware anymore. All the devices are unlinked, no access rights. And also, for starters, SE Linux contains what is called the permissive mode. The permissive mode works exactly like the usual, the enforcing mode, except, <coughs> except that it always says yes. That means that everything works as if the system were not patched. But you do get the log file entries. So you can see what would not work. And if you see something like um, uh, a long list of permission denied from a very critical program like the login, then you can be fairly sure that you need to update your policy uh, 
before the system will actually work. So permissive mode is, is a kind of trial mode where you can see what would happen if you would activate the system. And we usually recommend that you start with the permissive mode until you feel fairly sure. Uh, we've all had the experience that um, we issued the ABC toggle command, which um, turned the system into an enforcing mode, and it just stopped there. That's the price of security. And also for um, those of you who would like to get some more information on your own without bothering us, um, the most important things are, of course, the NSA website, the SourceForge Net um, website where you can get the source documentation, white papers by the NSA which explain in very much more detail the flask system that all this is based on and which I don't think would fit into a one hour session. And we've all, we also have um, a site which is Karsten's site mostly security enhanced linux.de uh, which is a German site about uh, SE Linux and we are slowly putting more content on it. So that, that was what I had at slides and uh, I hope we still have enough time left to take uh, any questions you might have because I'm sure that um, this is all a little bit much if you've never heard it before. But please wait here to answer your questions. Are there um, any nice tools uh, to help making the policy? Um, yes and no. Um, there are some. They are not very finished and not very polished. But um, they are slowly coming around. What is, what is the NSA's purpose of publishing such version of security and enhanced emails? Why do they do it? Is it good work? Um, no, I don't think they are paying for good work. The question was, what is the NSA's interest in, in doing this research and publishing it? Uh, I don't work for the NSA, so I can't tell you. But what they say is that um, the NSA has actually two missions. One is to spy on pretty much everything that moves. <laughs> and the other, less well known, is to secure the United States um, information infrastructure. And this is part of that research. So the, the purpose is by throwing it out there, they're putting it into the open source free software community and get a lot of credit power on it, and then it's safe. And then they can apply it to their own systems. That's the official version. Um, I don't think there's any factor or something hidden in there because by now the code has been so much changed by non NSA members. It would have been pretty hard for them to, to keep that active or active. But, well, you never know. But you can look in the code yourself. Another question. How do you perform updates on uh, the systems like uh, APT from Debian? Because uh, you can access a lot of files, I think. Which user or which domain is it running in? And what is the super, super user who can maintain the policy file? The second is a good question. Uh, let me answer the first uh, first. There, uh, Russell Conner has written a patch for uh, DPKE, which um, takes care of all policy things. It, um, needs, it, it is uh, a new version of, uh, of the tool, actually, and <clears throat> it does such tasks like reading the file after um, accessing and stuff like that. Of course, you have to run it in a domain that has enough access rights. The tool doesn't take care of that, how could it? But um, uh, it's, it's, well, if it doesn't have the rights, it will fail. Which can be a good thing if you uh, want to prevent malicious packages from changing certain critical files on your system. And I think for, for Zuzu, for Atmia, yeah. you can install a small one in permissive mode and you need a relay or this time. Okay, and you had the second question about who, uh, who watches the watches. 
Um, there is no super super user in Master Linux. There is no um, UID zero, which gets a shortcut everywhere where permissions are checked. You can define one in the policy. The default policy um, that is contained in the NSA version and in the Debian and SUSE uh, versions contains um, almost super super user. Uh, the sysadmin role is very, very powerful and can do almost everything. But uh, you don't have to. You can rewrite the policy and you can separate it. One thing you might want to do is have a regular system administrator who can do almost everything except changing the policy and uh, one security uh, administrator who can change, who can actually change the policy. But you can separate it however you want. The question was if there is an interactive way of editing policy very much like personal firewalls do it. Just throwing the, the arrow at you and asking whether you want to allow it or not. Um, the first answer is BI. Um, the second answer is yes in a way. There is not, not really such a thing, but there is a tool um, that a way you can feed the error messages in and it um, spits out the rules that you would have to write to take care of these messages. However, you still have to apply a little bit of brain power because uh, we work a lot with macros in the policy and a lot of things uh, can be done much better than um, this primitive tool suggests. Um, there are policies, <coughs> there are macros for file access, for example. A, file, a regular read write file access contains about eight syscalls. So um, you can either write eight rules, or you can write one rule with the correct macro. So that's a little bit of grammar that you still have to apply, but um, the, the new rules will actually make your life very easy. Okay, now I have uh, two questions. And the first is, this all sounds very similar to Pipula X. Was there a cooperation developing uh, SD Linux or? To what? Pipula LX. I don't know that very much. Um, I don't. It's from other think, systems. Yeah, I don't think there was any uh, cooperation. And is there a way to define roles depending on the way you are accessing the machine? Like if rule connects to the machine via console or uh, over the network? Yes, in theory. Um, <clears throat> it requires patching the tools uh, because the tool is. That which um, which does the actual transition or asks for it. We have patched the login tool, for example. If I log in on the console, I think I can show that. Um, no, I think I can't. Uh, if if I log in, the login um, command is has been patched to uh, present you with a list of options when you log in. So when I log into the machine. The user term on this machine is authorized for the roles user role and sysadmin role. <clears throat> My default role is user role, but when I log in on the console, I, I get a list of these roles and it asks me which one do you want to log in as. So that is one primitive um, implementation of what you are getting at. It, it's possible, but it does require change to the code of the whatever tool you, you use to connect. You mentioned the current point six in the settings. Could you go a bit more in detail? Is that an option that the point six that become default? The question was uh, that <clears throat> I mentioned it has to be accepted in the 2.6 kernel and whether it's default or an option. Um, I don't know exactly what it will be when 2.6 comes out. It has been accepted in the minus, into the Linus tree, so I assume that uh, when you unpack the kernel source of kernel, from kernel.org, it will be there, and you can activate it in the menu config. 
I don't know for sure though, it's just what I assume. Um, I would like to know what do you think are the main advantages of the steel lines versus competitive products such as RSPFC or the RSPFC? The main advantages um, compared to other commercial products which do something very similar. First of all, I think that SA Linux is one of the best implementations of um, Airbag and Mac and well, essentially the entire area, which relies on this minimum uh, privilege thing. It's, it's one of the better, I think. And the other one is, of course, it's free. Not as in it doesn't cost you anything, it does cost you a lot of time. But as in um, you can look in the code and if you don't like it, you can change it. And I think that's something that in the security area you definitely want to do. Someone over there? Excuse me, he didn't mention any commercial products. He mentioned RSBAC and GRS um, security. Okay, um, then the first point implies that I think that this is the um, better implementation because the other ones just don't go as far. I cannot compare on, on stuff like code quality or uh, how easy it is to configure and run because I don't have much experience with that. So I'm not going to say it's crap because I haven't looked deep enough. Uh, you were just talking about um, SLIs being free. I remember something about the developers of Flask holding patents on, um, well, the Flask architecture, which has evolved into SLIs. Um, do they apply, or what's the status? There was a very, very long and heated um, discussion on the mailing list about this. Um, there is a company that holds patents on the Flask architecture, which um, the SLIM system is based on. Personally, for me, I don't care. There are currently no software patents in Europe. And uh, the other point is that the GPL explicitly says that you cannot release on the GPL if there are any patents on the stuff that you're not willing to give up. So, if, if there are patents and if they are applied, but someone fucked up and it's not my problem. Set that would work with 
uh, your new program in that case. Has it been removed or have you used uh, as evenings for a while? So? I'm not sure what exactly you're referring to. Maybe to the new rules as it lines to that I, I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> what I remember from it was um, when you uh, turn on SE Linux in, in a learning mode uh, for a specific application, uh, you'd run that application a few times doing different things that the application would do. Then um, tell SE Linux, okay, print me a, a rule set for all the rules. Uh, this application is broken, turn it to default, uh, deny, and log everything. Um, there is no such tool in the newer versions. Not that I knew, but there is these, this new rules as a minus tool which does that not per application, but you can feed the valid messages file into it, for example. It's, it's a simple Unix filter, garbage in, garbage out. Are there any more questions? I always still have a quarter of an hour. Come on. Mm, essentially, everything is in the policy. Um, the, the actually, the actual process was like this: that um, you assign a label to a file in the file system. For example, um, the let's just so, show something with you. Is it readable at all? Okay. Great. Here the let me scroll this down a bit. This is a macro, one of the many macros we use. Um, the macro is the domain auto trans in an RC type SSH DX the kind of SSH type. This part is says if init RC, the startup script, runs a file labeled with the SSH DX type, then the resulting process runs in the SSH time domain. So 
that is essentially the way how when the system starts, our SSH key gets um, correctly started in some way. And then there are a number of rules um, to, do main, uh, to transition into user role when someone logs in, stuff like that. So what it does, as well as what it is allowed to do, is defined here in the policy. And you can write these uh, auto trans for pretty much everything. The only limitation is that you can only change domains uh, when you execute a program. This is one of our worst nightmares when it comes to PHP. Because PHP usually runs as a module in Apache. There's, there's no accent there. That's one of the main problems that we currently have. Does that answer your question? Thanks. The question was how the labels are stored in the file system. Um, do you want to answer that? I think you know more about that than I.
it, it does require a bit of work. It was definitely too much for, for one hour session. Um, but um, if there is any interest, so we can go to some someplace safe and uh, answer any more detailed questions and um, show you the system if you want to see something, how does the Apache stuff work. I don't have all services installed on this machine, but uh, there are a few that I can show you. So um, if you're interested in any more details, just uh, come up here and we're going to look for uh, some place where you can go, maybe eat something and show the machine how you whatever it is. And um, also we're, we'll be here on the Campbell. I'll be here for all four days. Okay, Carson is just here today, so uh, if you have any questions about Susan, or, um, he's the expert, uh, um, talk to him. And uh, today, and otherwise, just kind of fetch me when you see me running around somewhere doing anything important. Thank you very much.